Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? So good afternoon. I want to say thank you to President Tom. Thank you to Tom Gemmel, who made the arrangements. I hope I said your last name correct. To Peter Kay. Um, I've lived here now for three years, and I love Lancaster. I bought a condo in the Hager building and just love living downtown and uh, have watched the transformation of this United Way, which has been extraordinary. I have been a Rotarian uh, for 20 years. And I joined, it was kind of sporadic, but I was up in Portsmouth, New Hampshire as a Rotarian, and then I was in Gulfport, Mississippi. And I think it's time that I join Rotary again, don't you think? <laughs> I, think I think three years was enough time to get myself acclimated. And I noticed you didn't do happy dollars today, but I have a $20 happy dollar to say how happy I am to be here. <laughs> I did also... I did, oh gosh. I did also want to um, give a shout out to a, a couple of people. First of all, there are many supporters of United Way in here, and I can't thank you enough. I, can't, I don't have time to recognize you. But I want to give a shout out to John Herr, first of all. He doesn't like being recognized, OK? But he was our CFO for 10, 11 years, and he was nice enough to stay uh, another year when I first came. Uh, to allow for a, a smooth transition. So, John, thank you for all that you've done for us. <clears throat> also want to give a also want to give a shout out to Steve Stockwell. I wouldn't be here today if it was not for Steve. Steve was the chair of the search committee, uh, and he was the person that I worked with uh, during the process. And Steve, I'm very grateful, and I'm very happy to be here. And thank you for, the, for your work on that. So the way this is going to work is um, Dan German is going to speak uh, after me, and then Katie Schultz, and then Jamie Reichenbach, then Cheryl Heaster, and then Burwood Yost, just in the, in the order. And there will be some slides that they'll be referring to. I also want to acknowledge Kathy Grambois. She's the chair of our board. She's a lawyer with McNeese Wallace, and she's done a splendid job <laughs> since she took over in July. Also, Andrea Heberlein is our lead director of Collective Impact, and she's the one that's taken us through this Collective Impact process. And then Megan Howell is our person who's helping us with the uh, AV today. So basically four to five years, well, no, let me step back for a minute. About 15 years ago, the United Way put their toe in the water around Collective Impact, but they didn't call it Collective Impact then. They said, we need to start a homeless coalition. So we hired an Armstrong person, Lenny Walton, who worked for United Way. That was 15 years ago. And we said, it is inexcusable that there are homeless people in Lancaster County. So we put this coalition together, which was the first time we did this collective impact. We had the public sector, the private sector, the nonprofit sector all coming together and, and uh, making change happen. I think you may have heard this, but in 2016, we were infor informed by the uh, government that we are the first county in America to end chronic homelessness. And we are the first county in America to end cr uh, chronic veterans homelessness because of the collaborative, collective impact approach, which is now run by Jen Koppel uh, for the, the Homeless Coalition. So we had this great example so about four or five years ago, the United Way said, let's get into this 100%. Let's get into this collective impact model. Sm organizations by themselves cannot create systemic change. A single organization cannot. But if you can get organizations to work together, you could really move the needle on issues. So what they did is they set a new mission. So it's uh, to mobilize the caring power of our community to achieve impactful, systemic social change. Now, when you think back to the Homeless Coalition, we have, we, we have not ended homelessness, but we have systems in place so that there shouldn't be any homeless. If you see people on the street, this is an optional program. We have the beds for them. We have the programs for them. But there may be some choices that are, are made not to come into the shelters. But the systems are in place 
for the homeless population. They then set four bold goals that by 2025, 100% of kids will be ready for kindergarten, 100% of people will have a post-secondary career, reduce poverty by 50%, and 100% of people will have a medical home. So next slide is, just so you know, there are 17 collective impact partnerships. We are in the third year of a three-year funding cycle right now. And they've actually been reduced to 15 now because three have merged. But you can see that where they are located. And by the way, there is a community report on each of the tables that you can take with you that has all this information in it. But these are the 17 partnerships. I know you can't read it, but I hope when you go home, you take a look and look at these uh, partnerships that exist. And then what is collective impact? It's beyond partnering. It's beyond collaboration. These are the five components of collective impact. A common agenda, a common blueprint, a common plan, a shared measurement, agreement to share measurement, and to work with Burwood Yoast and F&M on tracking how these partnerships are doing. Mutually reinforcing activities, continuous communication, and allowing the United Way to serve as a backbone organization. So Andrea and her folks basically have work with these partnerships, and we serve as kind of the, we often call it a general contractor if you think of the building industry. But you're trying to keep these collaboratives moving forward. So that's what collective impact is. And I think at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dan German. You know that he's the CEO of CAP. He also uh, ran the Mayor's Commission to Combat Poverty. And we are really, really lucky to have Dan in our community. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, everybody, for having us in today. Um, for those of you who have met me before, um, I'm, gonna, I'm supposed to talk to you in under five minutes, and I can't do that without um, additional assistance. If you've ever heard me speak before, um, I could literally talk to you all day about this stuff. So uh, the Mayor's Commission to Combat Poverty, um, we met for 14 months. There were 12 commissioners and 48 work group members. And after working uh, through those 14 months, talking to um, several hundred people who were currently experiencing poverty in Lancaster City, we came up with a plan we called One Good Job. Um, because our, our work pointed to the fact that we needed to find market-based solutions within our existing workforce needs uh, to match up with people who were currently underemployed uh, in our communities. Um, F&M did a, a parallel study uh, that mirrored our own results that if we could connect heads of households of impoverished families to living wage work, that we could cut poverty in half in Lancaster City uh, by the year 2032. And so our One Good Job plan is up on uh, website combatpovertylancaster.org. And we're doing a lot of, of the, um, the sausage making, the, the messy work behind the scenes, because it's easy enough to say, well, we just need to get people good jobs. But there are a lot of reasons that people can't access those jobs. And so we've got to do a lot of work across sectors to get that done. That's one of the reasons why, when we were deciding on guiding principles, there were two that really uh, came to the fore for our work moving forward. One was a public health approach, which was not just putting um, Band-Aids on things and treating the symptoms, but our common agenda needed to be the causes of generational poverty in Lancaster City and in Lancaster County. Even though this was the Mayor's Commission, we agreed from our very first meeting that this was a county-wide issue. Uh, the, the second was collective impact, that we needed to work together across sectors with lots of folks from different disciplines aligning our strategies, being integrated. Uh, if you want to think about it in a way, think of partnership, people referring people back and forth to different agencies, and comparing that to integration, bringing our strategies together. Um, we're talking to employers who are looking at major gaps, sometimes in the hundreds of employees um, that they need to find over the next few years, and matching their strategies with our own in the nonprofit sector and in government, and then bringing people who are currently living in poverty to the table um, so that we're focus grouping. Would this work? Would these solutions get you to a place where you could take this job and it wouldn't hurt your family? Because sometimes what we found is in the system there are disincentives uh, to working. Um, I want to give you some quick examples. I have two and a half minutes left. So I want to give you some quick examples of what that's meant. Um, Lancaster Equity CDC is a new community development corporation that we formed as a result of the One Good Job Plan. 
What we did instead of starting a new nonprofit was we took a mothballed nonprofit that was a sister organization to the Community Action Partnership, and instead of creating a new competitor in the nonprofit realm, we asked all of the executive directors who are currently serving in the city on some kind of community or economic development nonprofit to join the board and bring our resources together so that we're aligning our strategies to figure out how we can work together. SACA, Habitat, the Lancaster City Alliance, Lancaster Housing Opportunity Partnership, CAP, the Homeless Coalition, all working together to make sure that our strategies are aligning and we're pushing each other's projects further and further towards the goal line. Um, that's led to some quick projects. One that has actually won us a national award through the U.S. Conference of Mayors was a CAP program called Capital Workforce, Capital Construction. Um, we hire people with criminal records who are currently struggling to get hired somewhere. They're getting turned down from one place to the next. We hire them and give them second chance employment and paid on-the-job training in rehab. And we're rehabbing blighted properties in the south side of the city where these gentlemen happen to live. Uh, and then selling those homes to low to moderate income first-time home buyers. Uh, we won an award to actually expand that to doing lead remediation in home-based child care centers throughout the city of Lancaster. And the Borough of Columbia has just awarded us a grant that was just matched by the Lancaster County Community Foundation to start a Columbia capital construction crew to work on the blighted housing problem in Columbia. So we can, we can have multiple wins with the same investment dollar. We're getting somebody a job that pays a living wage. We're working, uh, after they do that training, we're working with local construction companies to source them out as good employees that we can vouch for. Um, our first crew has been on the job for 12 months uh, and hasn't had a single disciplinary issue. One of these gentlemen spent five years in state prison, hasn't shown up for late one day in 12 months, um, and is, is actually in line to maybe be one of our supervisors in the future. That's, that's what we can do when we all work together. That's government, that's nonprofit, that's for-profit sector all aligning to make sure that we can reach better outcomes than we ever could by ourselves. One small example, given the time of year, with the last 30 seconds that I have, is um, I realized when I came back to Lancaster County uh, from a brief stint working in Tampa, Florida, that when I was driving down Duke Street to go back to my office after a downtown meeting, that once I hit King, shortly after King, the Christmas decorations abruptly stopped. What does that say to a family who lives in the South Side? that the whole city is lit up downtown and then it stops just as it gets to your neighborhood. What does that feel like? And it hit me. So it's been a couple of years, but working through Collective Impact, we're going to have the South Side's first Christmas tree lighting ceremony on December 16th. Uh, For-profit businesses, nonprofits, and community members are all volunteering to make that happen. It's going to be partnered with a Christmas decorating contest. And that might seem like a small thing, but as we're trying to build hope, as we're trying to tell people who are living below the poverty line that things can be different, and that they have a part to play in that, and it's going to be hard work for all of us um, to see a project like that come together as, uh, as quickly as it has. Uh, we started that about a month ago, and we're able to get all the partners together to get that done. The city's giving us the land and the electricity. Um, churches and local residents are coming out to sing and help us decorate. Uh, businesses have donated. We got a 12-foot tree donated. We're building a sign that says Southeast that we're going to wrap in lights. So that when you enter the southeast, you know that the residents there care about their part of the, the city as much as everybody else does, and that the Christmas spirit means a lot to them too. So macro, micro, at all levels, we're trying to bring people together to get things done so that we can show that we can have a different path forward. And if any place can do that, it's Lancaster County. I am going to turn it over now to Katie Schultz uh, from Mid-Penn Legal. Good afternoon. Thanks for having us. Uh, so I'm going to set myself a timer as well because I know time is precious here. So uh, again, I'm Katie Schultz. I'm an attorney with the Lancaster Office of Mid-Pen Legal Services, which is a, um, a nonprofit that provides free legal services to low-income persons in crisis situations. Um, and I'm here representing the uh, community impact partnership that's called the Lancaster Medical Legal Partnership. Our partnership is, is one of the smaller ones. It involves uh, an attorney from Midpen Legal Services, a financial case manager from Tabor Community Services, and uh, the United Way funding uh, uh, provides support to integrate those two positions into the team at Care Connections, which is a specialty clinic at Lancaster General Hospital that was created to address a specific problem, and that's of, of high utilizers. Um, and there's been a lot of attention around utilization there was a, a new yorker article uh, 
about a decade ago now, we'll call it about hot spotting, which is really talking about using public health models and data to look at what's driving the costs of healthcare. Um, and there's been a lot of attention in the healthcare industry across the country about social determinants of health. What are these factors that aren't genetics, um, that aren't, aren't really strictly medical problems, but that are driving healthcare utilization, making some patients cycle in and out of the hospital repeatedly and, and, and uh, generating a lot of healthcare costs. So Lancaster General did its own research around 2010 and found that a very small percentage of patients um, about 3% of the patients receiving Medicaid as their health insurance were generating about 50% of health care costs. So those are your high utilizers, um, folks who are, are really uh, very expensive for the health care system and I'd suggest probably for a lot of other sort of emergency care systems as well. Um, why are they so expensive and what can we do to, to, to help them be better? And so that's what Collective Impact does um, you know, through our partnership. We identified that problem and we're, we're putting an intensive uh, multidisciplinary team of services together to address it. Uh, so the financial case manager and myself were integrated in this healthcare team. It also has a pharmacist, a chaplain, social workers, patient care navigators. We wrap a bunch of services temporarily around these really high needs, complex patients. Um, who are, uh, face so many barriers. There's a very high incidence of childhood trauma in these patients. Um, their lack of social supports, uh, often chronic mental health issues, multiple chronic uh, medical conditions, lack of transportation, poor housing, uh, lack of access to income, trouble on the job, they're having trouble maintaining work. And we wrap all these services around them and, uh, and at this point, um, are showing real success with our interventions. Uh, we look at healthcare costs, uh, both for the 12 month period prior to enrollment in this temporary transitional program, and we look at healthcare costs after. Uh, in the two years that, that we've been going with the Lancaster Medical Legal Partnership, we've seen a, a cost savings of over $16 million. Um, so I think that, that we're on the right track in terms of trying to get to the root cause of what's driving the high utilization. Um, and we're, we're working on connecting them long term to a medical home, which is one of the bold goals of the United Way. Um, and we're trying to stabilize them in a really a sustainable long term way. Um, I am over my time, but I just want to say I think that Lancaster, I'm not from here, I've been here for over a decade, so I consider Lancaster County home. Uh, but I am amazed over and over again at how Lancaster County is really at the forefront with this stuff. You know, we're the small, largely rural county in terms of tackling this problem, high utilization, integrating all these services into a specialty clinic. Lancaster is really at the forefront. We're considered innovators across the country in the medical legal partnership community. And that's something that's been made possible with the support of United Way. I think that there's a lot of room for growth and opportunity to scale this model, spread it throughout the county, um, and even further than that. And so we're, we're really looking forward to the continued support of the United Way in this work. Thanks. going to say good morning, but it's now afternoon. So good afternoon. Thank you for having um, us here this, this afternoon. Um, my name is Jamie Reichenbach. I am Director of um, Early Learning for Luther Care for Kids. Um, and as a disclaimer, Katie, maybe I could talk to you about this. You should never take a headshot photo when you're nine months pregnant. That should not, that should not be allowed when I asked our marketing team for that uh, picture. So um, I am here um, as we are the lead agency um, for SAIL, which is Systems Aligned and Learning. Um, and what we do is we go out and support a very unique population within our community that is in-home child care providers. So oftentimes in our community, we see some larger child care facilities sitting on the corner. We see Bright Horizons, it's a well-known name around here. We see Ugros. Luther Care for Kids has five child care sites. These are larger center-based care, but there is a lot of home providers that are serving anywhere between six to 12 children directly in their homes. So they are the plumbers, they're the electricians, they are the teachers, they are the cooks, and it is solely them operating their small business. So our collaboration works with um, four other um, agencies within Lancaster County to support these home providers, which internally is going to help support the children, um, and focusing on bowl goal number one, which is getting children 100% ready for kindergarten. 
Um, when I actually started with Luther Care for Kids, I was the on the grounds person going out and doing the mentoring project. So over the years, it kind of shows you the growth in the last three years that I have moved from being the mentor going out and doing those services now to director of early learning for our entire Luther Care for Kids program. Um, and that is only because we've been able to grow this program so much. Um, we started out when I was going out into these homes serving less than 20 providers. We are currently serving close to 40, which has doubled over the three-year um, time period of receiving United Way funding and looking at this project and taking it to full capacity. Um, there's over 100 providers in Lancaster County alone that serve in-home ch children directly in their homes. Um, so we have a lot of growth to do. So 40 has been, you know, we're getting there, but we know that we have more work to do. Um, our home, our providers um, need supports for many different facets. Um, they get inspected on a yearly basis, so they need help going through their state inspections. Um, they are also looking at aligning curriculum to kindergarten standards in order to move towards that bold goal. And they can even look at their contracts, legal forms, and things like that to be able to have sustainability of their small business. Currently, we have one full-time mentor and one part-time bilingual mentor, um, which we know that we have a huge Hispanic population that we would plan to tap into further here over um, the next few years. Approximately, we're able to see a tw 200 children on a monthly basis. That equivalents to a large childcare facility, facility that I talked about previously. Um, in partners with the Mid-State Regional Key, were we able to put four of our providers to the CDA process, which is a um, Child Development Associates credential, so looking to be able to improve the quality that we're offering for children. Um, we're also able to offer, through the Lancaster County Council of Churches, we look to provide um, every provider with one healthy snack for the, for the month. And we look at how to make sure that we are, are making this a learning experience for both the provider and the children to look at healthy living moving forward. We've also um, connected with the Kobe's Family Services in order to look at an incredible year's curriculum that is tailored to the social emotional needs of children. So really having that whole child holistic approach. Um, so 17 of our providers have been through it, have enjoyed it so much that they're now looking, how can we, how can I take that course again? So we're looking to modify that course for them. We also had an old van sitting around Luther Care for Kids um, that wasn't getting utilized. Um, and so we hope that you guys see this out on the road, but we transformed this um, van um, in connection with the library system of Lancaster County to turn into the Be Ready Rover. And the Be Ready Rover is very similar to the bookmobile that you guys have heard about in Lancaster County, but it is strictly has curriculum and materials on board and books for children and the providers that we see. So everything is very child-centered. And they go out to these home providers on a monthly basis um, since 2016, they have been able to issue 15 new library cards. They found a lot of library cards that were not used regularly. They are now using them more regularly. And this thought always gets me is that 5,000, over 5,000 books and materials have been checked out since it hitting the road in 2016. Um, so again, we're making sure to support the home providers and what they see um, the needs of their center necessarily is. The future of sale um, is best said. We went to a um, collective impact summit by Mark Kabash. Mark, I'm sorry, Mark Kabash at the United Way summit, and it says, "If you're not failing, you're not trying, but be a smart failure." So sale continues to have smart failures. We work together. We have to figure things out. We have to come together. There's a lot of collaboration. There's a lot of communication. But sale is a model that we foresee going into the future, um, and we look forward to continuing that partnership here in Lancaster County. Um, I invite Cheryl Heister. Hi, everyone. I'm Katsu Minkofango Linda Dongo. So I'm Cheryl Heaster, and I'm a member of this club, and I um, am also the executive director of the Literacy Council of Lancaster, Lebanon. And in the interest of time, I'm going to forego my prepared remarks and just give you a tiny little bit of information about the work that we're doing so that you can hear from Burwood. Um, you are all familiar with the challenges that newcomers face because you support the um, Refugee Center at Reynolds Community School, right? Right, yay, thank you. So um, the collective partnership that I'm involved in is called Integration Services for New Americans. And we are addressing all four bold goals for people who choose Lancaster County as their home through immigration or resettle here as a refugee. 
Just a tiny little bit of data that I wanted to share with you. Did you know there are 23,000 foreign born residents living in our county? And did you know that more than 83,000 of the residents of Lancaster County speak a language other than English at home? A combination of limited or no English proficiency, limited understanding of American culture, and limited knowledge of the community creates significant barriers for immigrants and refugees. Even highly skilled immigrants and refugees find themselves living in poverty as a result of these barriers. So I also wanted to know if you knew that there were 10,000 job openings today in Lancaster County. So we have a really big problem. We have employers who need people and we can't birth our way out of labor shortages. And what makes immigration and refugee resettlement successful in a community is really high quality integration services. So I'm gonna stop talking, but I do wanna direct your attention to one thing. We left a copy of this on your table. There's one copy, but I have extras in the back. This is some, um, in, in some really great data on immigration and the impact of immigration in Lancaster County. And hot off the press today, we, we just did a press conference about this this morning. Here is immigration information about the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I hope you'll take a little bit of time to look at it. And now I'd like to um, turn this over to Burwood Yost from Franklin and Marshall. Good afternoon. I'm uh, the director of the Center for Opinion Research and Floyd Institute for Public Policy at Franklin and Marshall College. Um, the Center for Opinion Research at Franklin and Marshall serves as the external evaluator for the United Way's Collective Impact Initiative. Our primary role is to uh, help the United Way understand how the collective impact work is affecting the organizations involved and the communities that they serve. I'm here today to hint at the results that we're seeing with the Collective Impact Initiative. There are three primary takeaways from our assessment work that I'd like you to know. First, the Collective Impact Initiative is making our local health and human services providers more collaborative, more cohesive, and better connected. Second, our local initiatives have produced many local successes, and finally, that our local successes are being considered as national models. I don't have a lot of time today to provide you with all of the details that provide evidence and support each of these takeaways. You'll need to go online to read our report if you want more information. But I can share a few bits of evidence with you right now. Our evaluation has attempted to understand broadly how well the Collective Impact Initiative is supporting the five conditions that support collective impact that Sue talked about earlier. From the start, our evaluation process has attempted to understand how well the community impact partners are achieving these conditions by assessing the connections within and between partnership groups. Connections are the essential glue in a decentralized network like that being created by the Collective Impact Initiative. Our analysis of network connections reveals that the connectivity of community organizations has improved greatly during the first two years of CI work. This visual provides you a simplified picture of the scope of work going on in the community. When United Way began its work in 2015, there were essentially 22 different network groups based on their patterns of communications, even though we only had 17 partnership, partnerships. Our most recent analysis shows that these groups have consolidated into seven networks networks. This more streamlined network structure is pretty clear evidence that there is much more cohesiveness, communication, and cooperation, and fewer silos among the health and human services providers involved in this work. But these changes are not all we have to talk about. The collective impact partnerships listed on this slide are uh, applying innovative approaches to solve complex problems. These partnerships have been invited to share their approaches, their data, and their successes with other communities. And this interest suggests that these models are going to be replicated elsewhere in the United States. And let me just end by saying that the work being done in Lancaster is being recognized not just nationally, but internationally. 
People who think about this kind of work every day consider Lancaster a pioneer in collective impact. I think we should all be impressed by the progress this initiative is making. In a few short years, it has profoundly changed the way our community works to address its most important issues. I guess that's it. Thank you. Yeah.